All right, so I will welcome everybody. I'm Sherry Mather and I'm one of the board members of the Norwich Historical Society. And I'm happy that everyone has joined us tonight for the fourth of five Discover Norwich programs. Um, the mission of Norwich Historical Society is really to foster a sense of place through its people, its stories and the landscape. And we'd like to think that this Discover Norwich program is designed really to do just that. Um, I don't know if you all remember, but Discover Norwich was begun during COVID and it was really a way for us to connect with our neighbors and our community. And while the programs they feature a wide range of topics, I mean, we had raising chickens a couple of weeks ago, we did the history of the Norwich in last week. Last year, we did a story about the Olympians who have come from Norwich. Um, the, it's a wide variety, but we feel that history really informs them all. And for most of our talks, we are lucky because we've been partnering with other Norwich organizations. And tonight we are lucky to partner with the Norwich Public Library. Um, as you might have heard, the Norwich Historical Society suffered a break-in and vandalism uh, right before the new year. Um, the intruder was a teen in a mental health crisis and it was a very depressing situation all around. We are responding to the event in several ways. Um, one is that the Discover Norwich donations um, this year are gonna be dedicated to increasing the security of the Historical Society itself, both our collections and the property. And we're also gonna send 20% of the donations to the Youth and Family Services Division of Healthcare and Rehab Services, or you may have know it as HCRS. Um, and that serves Windsor County youth that are in trouble. So. Without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Sarah Rooker, who is our Historical Society Director, and to Lucinda Walker, the Director of our Public Library. They are gonna be answering questions that are previously submitted, um, but we are gonna welcome questions from the audience. Um, if you have a question, please put them in the chat and I will keep an eye on the chat and interrupt um, Sarah and Lucinda if your question is apropos for the topic at hand or we will answer your question at the end. Um, I'm really looking forward to finding out if we can stump Sarah and Lucinda with some of your questions. So please enter them into the chat when they come about. And here you guys go. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's so fun to be here with you, Lucinda. <laughs> oh my gosh, Sarah, I feel like we're on a game show. Uh, we are on a game show. <laughs> we're going to have so much fun. We created this to feel a little bit like a game show for you all. Um, and we're going to ask some true false questions and play a little, few little games. But we'll go ahead and answer um, as many questions as we can that you all submitted to us. And as Sherry said, if there are additional questions at the end, um, you can put them in the chat and we'll turn to those probably about quarter of, six, quarter of uh, seven. Um, so we finished in time for the um, program that's coming up later. Um, also, um, oh, there was something else I was gonna say about that, but it's gone out of my head, so that's okay. <laughs> It'll come back. <laughs> it will come, come right back. back. Oh, I know what I wanted to say. I know for a fact, looking at the list of people um, who are here tonight, but some of you know more about Norwich than I do. And that happened last year too. And so you can also chime into the chat with any corrections you might like to share. <laughs> and maybe we'll have you help us answer some questions at the end. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen and we shall get ourselves started. Here we go, all about Norwich. Your burning questions answered. And probably the first burning question that we decided we should answer is where did the name Norwich come from? And the answer is a little complicated. Uh, I'm showing you two maps here. On the left is a map of England. And when you look at it, you'll see a lot of familiar uh, town names. There's Hartford and Stratford and Woodstock and Windsor and Norwich and Orford, Thetford, Haverhill, Enfield, all of those names and people from those communities came across um, and eventually probably in a second or a third generation ended up in Connecticut. And here you see all those names again, Windsor and Hartford and Enfield and Norwich and Lyme and New London and Plainfield. And you might think, well, um, Norwich was named after um, named Norwich after Norwich, Connecticut, because people from Norwich, Connecticut came to Norwich, Vermont, but that was not true. 
sorry, I'm having a little issue with my mouse. Governor Benning Wentworth began to issue lots and lots of charters as the French and Indian War was starting to end. And he issued Norches in 1761, along with many other charters. And the, the original proprietors were actually from Mansfield, Connecticut. And um, so they were not from Norwich, but he was naming and um, providing these charters named after obviously these English and Connecticut towns, but it wasn't Norwich, Connecticut residents who were purchasing the um, records. I think one other thing I wanna say about this is that really the lands were named mm -hmm. Wabonakik, which means place of the dawn. And this is, this is a map showing the really the Abenaki um, view of this region and their land. And if you look, one of the things I love about this, oh, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Um, this piece um, painted by Fred Wiseman is that um, it's oriented east at the top. And that's because they, the Abenaki really oriented their world to the dawn. But when you look at this map, it's like a journey map through the Abenaki world. And um, on the bottom here, you can see Lake Champlain. You can see men from Magog um, over here. I think you can see my cursor, thumbs up if you can see my cursor, yes. Um, here's Connecticut going down like this and the name Connecticut down on the bottom right. You've got Winnebezaki here, Piscataqua right here. Um, so many of the name, place names have been retained and this is their world that's really oriented toward the ocean, rivers, navigation, a river, water world. And we must remember that when we think about where did the name Norwich come from. And I see the chat, but I'm assuming the chat's okay. I don't have it open. Ah, it's all fine. Okay. <laughs> don't you worry. <laughs> all right. Um, We'll talk about maps afterwards, but lots of them are on our website and I'll show you where. Lucinda. Okay, so, yeah, so one of the questions we got um, was where does the water in the village come from? And we're gonna throw this question out to you. So why don't you answer into the chat? We've got three choices, the Connecticut River, the Hanover Reservoir, or a 500,000 gallon tank on Dutton Hill. So if you want to play along, Start. I see. I see Heidi, Carla. They've put some stuff in the chat. Oh, it's looking good. It's looking good. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have people who know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Lots of possibilities. One person says Connecticut River. <laughs> yes. Good. We've got one person with Connecticut River. Uh, a lot of people saying C. So the answer is actually C. Yes, it comes from um, an aquifer about, uh, oof, I'm not sure how deep it is, uh, very deep, <laughs> but um, about uh, a million gallons of water a day can be drawn from this aquifer. So it's the water is pumped up five miles to the, the um, storage tank at Dutton Hill, which is indeed a half a million gallon storage tank. And then it's pumped back down to the village. And I think there's even a, a pic, there's a picture of the pumping station, but oh gosh, as I knock everything over here. Um, so I, I was kind of impressed that uh, a million gallons a day can be taken from this water source. Um, I, what I don't know is how many gallons a day do people are, are used? That would be a good question to look up, actually. And I'm going to make a note and answer that question at some point. <laughs> um, and just to just also to put a little plug in that that picture and diagram came from our new graphic history um, illustrated by Emily Zay on the rivers and mills of Norwich. All right. So can I interrupt before? Sydney Smith was commenting that there's a well on Route 5, which I think is the picture that you have there. Yes, this is it, the pumping station for the well. And then it goes up to the reservoir at Dutton Hill and then back down again. That is correct. Okay, here's our next one. True or false, Beaver Meadow once had a post office and two churches. We had questions about wanting to know a little bit more about Beaver Meadow. 
Is that true or false? And we'll jump along here and I'll say that um, here you'll see, oh, wait a minute, now I forgot what the question was. <laughs> a post office and two churches, that would be true. And I've made some red lines to show you, this is 1869 and you'll see um, the Methodist church um, before, um, this is in a different location from the Beaver Meadow Chapel today. Um, there's the schoolhouse. Here's the cemetery. Today, the chapel is sort of more in here. There was a store and post office a little bit further down, and then a Baptist church. I'm sorry about my cursor. Um, and here's, there was also a Baptist church, which was moved to Sharon. And at one time, Beaver Meadow had a population that was about equal to the rest of Norwich. It was a very populous area of town. And we move to three truths and a lie. Here's the first one. Hillside Cemetery used to be a ski area. True, truth or lie? I see some truths. True, true, true. That would be true. Oops, someone says lie. Well, it would be true. And here is a picture. Um, someone asked us about ski areas in Norwich. This is the Alto Ski Hill, which was just to the left of the Hillside Cemetery. And um, the ski area covered the entire side of the hill with a 300 foot drop. There was this rope tow that was powered by a very loud um, Ford truck engine. And it was named after Al Peavy, Al's tow. It took three to five minutes to ski down and five to seven minutes to ride back up. And one feature was that you would go up um, on the rope toe and then there was this flat, as you can see there, and you had to kind of glide across the flat and then grab the rope again um, at the end of the flat to keep going up to the top. And this is where the Ford um, Sayer Ski Program began in Norwich and kids were taught to ski at Alto for a cost of $1.50 a winter. And word has it that also kids would empty, would return their empty soda bottles down to the general store and use the money for the skiing. It cost 50 cents, which went to pay the gas for the rope tow engine. Um, and if any of you do the walk around the Hobson Loop, you, mo you might have seen a little tiny sign um, on, the, um, on the side of the road that's called Samples Hill, which was named after Paul Sample. Um, who owned the property, and it was a 25 meter ski jump. All right. Here we go to our next one. Is this you, Lucinda? It is. Okay. Truth or lie? Farmers used to power their equipment with dogs on treadmills. What do lie. people think? I'm hearing, <laughs> I'm hearing a lie. I'm hearing a true. Oh. <laughs> I was very surprised by this answer. It's yeah. a lie because they used sheep as one form of power. And I do believe there's another well, picture. Yeah, right? here, I'm just going to share on though that what, yeah. he's, what he's doing right now is he's, he's running this cream separator <laughs> um, with the sheep. I love this. And then here's another one. Horses. And what yeah. are the horses running here, Sarah? Do you know? Is you know, this like I'm a, not quite sure what they're mill? doing here, but they're doing something with sawing, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've not seen one for dogs. I'm, I'm sure there was, but we've got sheep and then this picture of the horse. All right. Someone else asked us, what about what was going on out on Route 132? And so truth or lie, there used to be a factory village on Route 132, and you can guess truth because that's what we're going to share. <laughs> but right at this spot, you could see the Pattersonville Chair Company. It was founded in 1872 when Spencer Patterson bought a sawmill and a shingle factory on the banks of the um, um, Pampanusic River. And he got, he put it there because there was a really good flow of water. There was good transportation via the railroad depot down in Pompanusik. And there was a ready supply of usable logs which came from the log drives on the river. Now here they, he built eight tenement houses for his workers and a company store that had also a dance hall. 
And it was first powered by water wheels and then a gasoline powered engine. And if you canoe up in there, you'll see the remains of the dam from that held the water in that mill pond for the water wheels. But at one point in time, 10 train cars, they, they produced enough chairs to fill 10 train cars a year. They used 800,000 feet of lumber in a year, which would be about 150 miles of logs to make their chairs. And I just love this photo of um, the crew all standing outside the chair factory. And then we got an email. Could you show us some photos of log drives? Well, who doesn't love some love the log drive photos? So here's another picture by Emily Zay. Here is a wonderful photo of the log drives coming down the Connecticut. And yes, that's the Ledger Bridge. And you're seeing, um, you're looking from Hanover across to Norwich and um, into the little hamlet of Lewiston. And millions of logs were driven down the river really from after the Civil War until the last log drive in 1915. The log drives started to end as um, pulp wood for paper was in greater demand and there were trucking roads and, and more dams on the rivers made it harder to have the um, log drives. But the last big log drive was 1915 and there were 65 million feet of lumber driven from Canada down to New York with 500 men. So you can imagine the scale of these log drives coming down through um, the really incredibly dangerous, um, dangerous work. You know, the way, the way it worked was that they would, in the winter, they would um, cut all the logs and they dragged them to streams and they dam up the streams until the spring when the water was, had backed up enough that they could let it go, let the dams go and the water, the logs would then shoot down into the Connecticut River. So you know how um, much flowage there is on the Connecticut River in the early spring. So imagine what that was like for them. And this was before the Wilder Dam, so the flow of the river was even faster than it is today. And here's another great one of them underneath the bridge. Okay. Here you go, Lucinda. Okay, here's a library question. So um, the Norwich Public Library, was it housed in the Norwich Congregational Church Vestry? Was it burned in the Norwich University fire? Was it once housed in a mobile trailer or all of the above? What do you think? Any, any guesses? Sydney, you're Sydney from the works library. at the library. That's she no knows. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but Carla's coming in. Woo, yes. Yes. <laughs> the answer, yes, is indeed all of the above. We have moved around quite a bit since 1880. Um, and in fact, we did, we were formed in 1880 uh, and we're uh, our first place of business, if you will, was at the vestry of the Norwich Congregational Church. And then we moved in this photograph. Um, we, are, we took um, spots on the second floor. This is Norwich University building. And then After in 1880, wait, sorry. After it moved. After it moved, yes. Yeah. Um, and then in 1897, there was a fire that destroyed the building and most of the library's collection. Um, and at that point, the Hazen family donated money, uh, I'm sorry, not money, land for the library, which is where it was built in 1901. But many of you, I, I know you know, um, we had this massive, beautiful renovation uh, in 98, 99. And so uh, this great idea was to move the collection and offices to these two trailers, which were located at the American Legion. Lisa Melchman started just after everything moved into the trailers. And she remembers so well the mud of that, that march, which we found these pictures. And she, she was like, oh God, it was just awful. People had put planks up, but the um, renovation went really quickly, essentially. So they were only there for about six months and then moved into our brand new building in um, 2000, and, 2000. So yeah, so we've moved around, but we're staying, sticking where we are now. <laughs> I remember using those trails. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's another one. Truth or lie, Hobson Road used to be called Mechanic Street. 
What do we think about that? I bet you'll guess that is true. And we received this question too, because on some maps really from, um, I think the 1990s listed the, Hop the Hobson Road area as Mechanic Street. And here you see a slightly blur blurry uh, map with the word Mechanic Street on there. Here's Bloodbrook coming through, and Mechanic Street, here's Main Street. And why was it named Mechanic Street? It was named Mechanic Street because it was an area closer to the mills at Blood Brook. There were artisans who lived in this area. And on the right here, you're actually seeing a blacksmith shop that was right at the fork in the road. Um, lots of postcards were made of this blacksmith shop. And um, so Beaver Meadow goes to the right. Um, you can see a little bit of Fairview Cemetery off on the top right there. And it was torn down in 1914. Um, and then the road was paved and renamed in the 1990s. But while we're in the neighborhood, another question we got were who were the Hobsons? Well, John Hobson came to Norwich quite early. His first child was born in Norwich in 1766. Remember I said that Charter was 1761. So he's one of the first kids to be born here. And Hobson fought in the Revolutionary War under Norwich's Peter Alcott and may have been in the battles of Bennington and Saratoga. But the story that we really caught on to was the story of Hobson's at the time of the Civil War. So this is a map from 1856 and um, here is Elm Street. There's, there's the brook going up like this. And then this is Hobson Road. So here's the corner. And you'll see when you get to the top of Elm at the corner of Elm and, um, or Hop, Elm and Hobson on the left, you'll you know there's a cape there. And that was Henry Hobson. And then on the right, the house is still there also. Um, it just sold would be, um, Oh, I forgot the, who the N. Hobson is, what his first name is. Is it William? Was it William? I can't. No, that was their son. Oh, okay. So the two Hobsons lived across from each other. They were brothers. And um, the two oldest Hobson boys who lived in this house here were named William and Alan. And they both died in the Civil War. And we have letters between them about the, you know, um, writing back and forth. And we have a letter from William's commanding captain who wrote to his sister informing him of her brother's death. And here's what they said about poor William who lived in this house here up on the, on the left corner. Your brother was shot by my side. He was about six feet from me and the bullets were flying like hail around us when he said to me very calmly, Captain, I shall bleed to death. I laid him down and sat beside him while he breathed his last. I was compelled to leave him, but my heart remained. So William died and Alan died. And then Mary, their mother died two years after that and left two orphans. So out of the eight children in the family, only three of them survived to adulthood. And Nelson, that's who it is, Nelson Hobson, who lived over here, William Henry's brother, died just a few months later. So by, by right after the war, like right after this map was created, everybody had died and they were orphans who, who left. And so it was named Hobson, but Hobson disappears from the maps. Another question we had was while we're in the neighborhood, Elm Street, when was the street extended? And here you see two mid-century modern houses that were built in 1948 when the hunters um, were building houses in the area. And on the top right is the Wentworth Eldridge house built at the top of the road. And the Drury house is, as you're going up Elm Street on the left, also from 1948. So it was after World War II when there was this a burgeoning of population of new professors coming in and mid-century modern houses being built in this area that um, the road extended beyond the Hobson farm and up Elm Street.
Your turn. Okay. How long has the Norwich Public Library been a town department? Since it was formed in 1880, since the energy crisis of the 1970s, or never? What do people think? I'm seeing some C's. Never, C's, never. Oh, yes. Good. <laughs> I am glad to see all of those. Yes, we have never been a member of a town department. Um, in the state of Vermont, we are known as an incorporated library. Um, there are 189 libraries in the state of Vermont, and approximately 50% of them are incorporated. That means that we were formed by associations and we're technically a 501c3. Um, each year, as many of you know, we go to town meeting to make an appropriation ask and then town residents vote on that ask. The town first made a gift of $50 101 years ago um, to, to um, make the books free to all. Before that, the library was really sustained by um, member fees that the association uh, members would make a nominal uh, donation of like say $8 or $5 and that gave them access to the lending library. They were allowed to take one book out at a time. Um, and in 1922, uh, the town wanted to make the library sort of open to all and not just based on membership. So that is when we got our first appropriation gift. And um, I hope we get another appropriation <laughs> gift this year. But um, uh, that is it. So we are not a member of the town. We are actually a 501c3. You know, I'm just going to plug and say, we are too. Yes. And we also have an appropriation coming up. Yes. And it's a really important part of our budget. And it certainly helps us make sure that we can have our community center open and free for all. And it means that we are able to host book groups, the Trails Committee, the Conservation Commission, a Spanish language group. Lots and lots of groups come to use our kitchen and meet. And we wouldn't really be able to do that without the support of the town. So thank you all. And that's our public service announcement. That, that, that's, right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Now we'll go back to our formal, uh, our regular <laughs> scheduled programming. Um, so who was Ford Sarah? We got a couple questions um, on Ford Sarah. And actually, Sarah said, you should take this on because I really didn't know much about Ford Sarah. Um, so who was Ford Sayre? He was a man who moved up here. He went to Dartmouth, graduated in 1933. Um, he and his wife, uh, Margaret, became the managers at the Ravine Lodge at Mount Musilock. Um, in order to kind of keep business going, they got the idea of starting uh, a ski school, a junior, junior ski school. Um, and one thing that was really important to him was that kids have access to skiing. Um, unfortunately, Fort Sayer died rather young uh, during military service during the Second World War. Um, he's actually buried up at Hillside Cemetery, but his wife um, wanted to keep that dream alive. And so she asked that in lieu of sending flowers during the funeral, funeral that um, there be a fund uh, created in his name um, to keep the ski school going. And, and to this day, Ford Sayre is a very um, lively and vital part of the ski scene in the Upper Valley and has in fact um, been sort of home base to a number of people who have gone on to reach Olympic heights. The picture on the right um, of the young kids with the skis, I believe that's at the Norwich Inn, is that right, Hanover, Sarah? Hanover Inn. Hanover Inn. Um, picking up their uh, their equipment um, that uh, was made nice and accessible for them. So at any rate, he, he was a dashing man, I thought, Ford Sarah. I, I went down a rabbit hole a little bit yesterday. Um, <laughs> and uh, I don't know, there's something about skiers, particularly in the early years, a lot of them didn't make it to, to mid or late life, but they led these incredible uh, lives all, all around snow, which I found fascinating. All right. And, you know, I think it's really neat that Ford Sarah is actually buried at Hillside, you know, where the ski ski area was. Okay, true or false, at one time there were as many as 15 schoolhouses in Norwich. What do you think, everybody? Hmm. People are thinking hard, true, false. 
True, true. I'm tricking you. <laughs> the answer would be false. There were more than 15 schoolhouses. In 1836, there were 20 schoolhouses with a total of, can you imagine, 774 school age kids in Norwich? Isn't that crazy? That's so crazy to think about. Um, in 1865, at the time of the Civil War, there were 19 districts. They had 265 kids in the summer, 108 in the fall, 287 in the winter. So that gives you a sense of um, how important it was to be able to have kids be able to be home and work on the farm. The average class size was 16 in the summer and 22 in the winter. Mm -hmm. um, although I do know that there was, um, I think 90 kids in the schoolhouse, in that brick schoolhouse on Main Street, the, the brick building that's just been um, renovated next to the parsonage. I think it was over 90 kids in there. I don't know how that teacher managed. But anyway, <laughs> here's some photos. Here's the Bragg Hill Schoolhouse closed in 1919. And I just love this photo of the kids outside playing ball. It's such a great photo. I love their hats. Here's New Boston Schoolhouse. And here you see on the top left, Sprout. The bottom left is Turnpike. The top right is Pompanoosic. And the bottom right is Root. And I like seeing on the top left, I'm using a sled to get to school. And the bottom left, you've got skis and I think maybe snowshoes. And I love the kids from the 19, I don't know, 30s and 40s, all in their overalls. Mm -hmm. And they're all wearing shoes, which I think is interesting. And I wonder if they're wearing those shoes just for the day. But notice all they have bicycles too. So actually that might be a little bit later. I didn't write down the date of that one, but it looks about right. And then on the bottom, there they are on top of the wood pile because the students are responsible for providing the wood <laughs> and stacking the wood and getting the fire lit. The last one room schoolhouse closed in 1951 and it was the Pompanous schoolhouse. Um, and it was 1963 that the Dresden um, plan was put in place and kids started going over to Hanover. Okay, I get this question, oh, once a month, I think. <laughs> I get these emails into the info at Norwich History site. Why is Bloodbrook called Bloodbrook? Let's see what everyone has to say. A, the runoff from upstream tanneries turned the water red. B, the Blood family was a prominent early Connecticut family. C, copper turned the water red. Or D, it was the site of an upstream massacre. Hmm. I see A, upstream tanneries is one vote. Unknown. I get in a direct message to me. <laughs> hmm. Well, B from Wendy. Wendy, I don't know. I would say actually nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> but here are some things I can say about it. When I, I looked at this again pretty closely because I thought, well, of course they must be named after the blood family. But this is a 1796 map of Norwich. And if you notice here, it's labeled Blood Brook. But when I looked in the census for 1790, 1800, there's no blood family. They don't come until 1810. So it's not named after the blood family. At least I don't think it is. And the former slaughterhouse on the top right at Huntley, that's a 20th century slaughterhouse. But I love this photo on the left. And yes, there was a lot of, there was a tannery, there was a slaughterhouse, there's sawmill, there's a grist mill. There's a lot of industry on the river um, at this time. But it was named Blood Brook before all this industry really appeared. So you can see this is Elm Street. You might recognize this. Is this house yellow now? Yellow red brick on the right, is that correct? And then here's the Stetsons on the left. But look at, and this is the bridge area at the brook and look at the mills. It's one of my favorite photos that we have. Okay, we're getting down there to our questions. 
Um, someone else also asked us if there was a brickyard. The brickyard was further downstream, um, sort of more by the car store area down that, that part of, um, of Blood Brook. And yes, the brick houses in Norwich were made from those bricks. And then, you know, there's this question, could it have come from an older history? There is an oral history that suggests that there was a bloody massacre that once took place, but not in record in written records, but in native oral traditions there are. And so I think it's important for us to think through um, the importance of um, oral histories and stories and their, and their validity too. And we do know that students have found um, Native American utensils and um, tools along the brook while exploring the brook. Mm. All right, here you go, Lucinda. Okay, so now we're gonna do a little reveal. So uh, I want you to look as we reveal more of this picture to see if you can figure out where this photograph ultimately has been taken. So this is the first little bit of the puzzle to be revealed. Okay, here's the next bit. You see some houses and maybe a covered bridge or something. And there's something else. Oh, a little bit more. See, what is it? Where could we be? Oh, Sydney's in, Sydney's in there. Yes, it is <laughs> Lewiston. Um, so I, I, I don't think I can like the cursor, but what you're looking at is Lewiston taken from the Hanover side of the world. Um, you can see sort of smoke from a train that's coming into the train station. Thank you, Sarah. Yes. Um, you can see a little bit of the ledger bridge, which at that time was still a covered bridge and not the bridge with the balls that we all drive across multiple times a week. Um, and uh, Lewiston, as many of you know, and many of you have probably done the walking tour, uh, was was a very active part of, of uh, this part of the river until um, 1967 when it was burned and raised um, due to the building of I-91. Um, and if you look at these two pictures, you can kind of see uh, what, <laughs> what it looks like now as you're coming across the Ledger Bridge. We, my first question when I saw this picture was, what are all those people doing? And so, um, I did a little research, and this is from the climate strike of September of 2019, which feels like a century ago, but that was when over 700 people um, took to the streets, cr crossed from Hanover into Norwich um, to, to sort of bring issue of climate change, and then compare that to sort of where the road was going into Norwich on the photo on the left-hand side. You can kind of see how it Screws up the goes up the hillside. Um, so went up sort of, like that. Yes, right. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. A busy, bustling town, and then again, you're looking at. Um, I love this picture on the left hand side of two Hanover, as it says written on the top of that roof. Um, just looking at the bluffs on the other side of Hanover. Um, I don't, you know, you don't when you're driving up towards the center of Hanover, you know, you realize you're going up a fairly steep hill, but to see how um, how the landscape looked back then is I think quite remarkable compared to the sort of boring way it looks now, <laughs> my own personal opinion. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of our last questions, which thank you Demo in his wonderful blog post the other day. How long has Bonnie been our wonderful town clerk? Everyone should know this by now. 28 years. We will be wishing Bonnie a happy retirement after town meeting. Um, she worked uh, for two years ahead of time before she took over in 1994. She trained for two years with, I think, Karen Porter was the person she was the assistant to. And um, she's getting a lot of great acclaim as she is doing. A, a turning over of a town clerk is a big deal. I know in my town in Brownsville, we all are nervous that our wonderful town clerk, Kathy, will retire at some point and people don't know what we'll do. But we like to raise a glass to Bonnie. Definitely, we all need to be raising a glass. 
All right, and here's a, here's a question that came from a young person to the library. Is there a mayor of Norwich? And I <laughs> sort of said, well, maybe the question is who governs Norwich? And I would say the answer is we all do. And this little illustration also comes from our, one of our new um, graphic histories that Emily Zay has created. Um, and there are so many ways to get involved in making a difference. Um, you know, you, you can be the voter who elects the select board and um, has a voice in who the new town clerk will be. You can get on the energy committee and get involved in energy if you're passionate about it. You can get involved in trails if you're passionate about that. There's, there are so many possibilities. You can volunteer at the Historical Society and help put together next year's program um, or at the library. And so all of those pieces, all of our institutions make up a really strong community. And um, there are many, many ways to be involved to make, um, to help um, create a strong town. Our final question was how to learn the history of my own little patch of Norwich land. And the answer is come next week. <laughs> we are gonna have the most fun program. Alan and I um, will be sharing books, um, online maps and sources for you of where to find um, information. We're going to take you into the town clerk's office as much as we could. We created this before COVID actually. Um, and show you um, how we traced uh, his house actually back through time from his deed all the way back to the 1761 proprietor's map. So we'll walk you back through it and answer questions and try to help you get started on learning some stories about your, your own property, whether it's your house or a new house on an older piece of property. I did it for my home in Heartland, which was a brand new house, but it was high in the hills. And I desperately wanted to know what farm it was attached to. And doing the deed work back, I found the farmhouse and it just made me feel so much more connected to my land I knew who had made those stone walls. I knew what animals had been grazing around where my house was today. And it was really special. And so I encourage everybody to work on, on that kind of a project and join us next week as we figure it out. So I'm gonna stop our share and we're gonna open it up to any additional questions. I know there was a question about maps and on the North Historical Society website in um, under, I think it's under research, um, or we have links to local history and also one that says how to research your house. And all the maps are linked there. Um, it goes from the 1761 proprietor's map all the way up to the 1940s, the 1950s, the 1970s. Any map that I could find that had a person, a homeowner's name on it, is there. So um, you can you can find them all there. Um, in terms of printed maps, um, you can there's a um, there is a website where you can order um, printed historic maps um, historic New England maps.com I think it's called. Um, but there is there is a site that um, where you can order them. Um, as posters. Do we have any other questions? Anything anyone wants to share or say in our last few minutes? It was very fun answering all these questions and we did most of them. There was one question we skipped. Should we confess which one it is? <laughs> it was a question about parcel five. And someone right. said, what are all the white tubes sticking out of the ground at parcel five? And we asked around and no one seemed to be able to tell us exactly what they were. The closest we got was Bree said she thought they were off gassing something, but we couldn't figure out what that was. And it sounded a little scary. <laughs> so we don't, we actually don't know, but we, we worked hard at it. I had submitting a question. Oh, you asked a question about Beaver Meadow, Claudia. Um, and the question about Beaver Meadow um, is one about a, um, a corner um, at Mitchell Brook Bridge that has been known and appears on maps and deeds as Darkey Corner. And I can tell you that it is a, it is a story that um, 
is a story of racism. And it's a story that I want to spend time um, thinking about how to share um, to the community in a way that promotes conversation and isn't just part of so a driving tour or um, a blog post. But there was a minister who lived in Beaver Meadow at the corner there in, 18, in the mid 1880s. And he was harassed and abused by local um, young men in Beaver Meadow and he was eventually murdered. And his house was um, left, was I think it was burned. So, and, and the legacy of that corner um, remained on the maps and in the deeds for um, uh, up until I think I could try to remember now fairly re till 1930s or 40s hmm. so it's a story um, it's a story that needs um, more more work um, so that we can think about how to share um, stories of inclusion and diversity but also racism and how do we balance that out and and, and tell those stories so, um, yep, Darky Bridge, it's also known as um, Darky Corner. It also is known as N Corner and N Bridge. Um, so it's a pretty racist, there's some pretty racist pieces. Um, okay, and there's Heidi saying um, there are monitoring wells to monitor the groundwater levels. Oh, oh and Claudia, I'd also say to you that um, the story is written up in the um, Norwich History Book. Um, so you can, you can okay. take a look at this one, this one, <laughs> look at us. We're so prepared tonight. <laughs> and I have a newspaper clip clipping about it too, that I, I was, that I have. Um, so that, that's the story. And it's, a, and it's, it's a reason we haven't done a big, huge, um, post about that in Beaver Meadow yet, because I want to think about how to do it in a way that, that allows for conversation. Any other questions? The mystery of those white pipes resolved. Thank you. Yes, thank you, <laughs> Heidi. Tell your son a big thanks from us. <laughs> yeah, even the trails committee didn't know what they were. So, <laughs> um, any other questions? It don't sound like it. Feel free to unmute if you've got any. You can unmute and chat. Otherwise, I think we are pretty much um, done for our evening and it's just in time for you to switch gears to go to the select board <laughs> candidates night tonight and um, hear everything they have to say and thanks for joining us early so that we could um, we could offer this ahead of time yeah thanks everybody <laughs> it was fun it was so fun <laughs> Lucinda no.